This is a 1967 Gibson J45. My roommate just brought it home and I figure, why don't we lay down some tracks with it? Now I've had this folk song that I've been writing. It's been bouncing around my head. So this is a perfect time to get to try out this guitar. However, after a little while, I realized that this guitar is a little too spanky, a little too bright for this track. So we switched to using my Martin. Now, typically when I record acoustic guitars, I'll use a two mic setup, one facing the 12th fret and one more on the body of the guitar. But I feel like sometimes I end up fighting to try and get them to sound closer to each other because when one is panned left and one is panned right, the body mic actually has a lot more depth and a lot more warmth. And then the brightness coming from the neck mic, well, the contrast doesn't always play nicely when you pan them hard. So I had the idea to use this U87 in the middle and get that nice kind of mono sort of direct sound, but then to throw up my TLM 103s almost like overheads. So one is a few feet to the left and one is a few feet to the right and they're both up above me. And I don't know if I invented this technique, but I haven't seen anyone else use it. So if you've ever done this, let me know, or if you've seen anyone else use it, let me know. But anyway, using this new mic technique, I was pretty happy with the sound that we got. So when it comes to recording acoustic guitar, well, it's one of the more meticulous instruments to record. If you don't sit in the same exact spot from take to take, it's gonna sound different. If your pants make a rustling noise, that part of the take is ruined. Fret buzz, all that stuff, it's getting picked up by these super high fidelity condenser mics. But when you get it right, it is super satisfying. Or you can choose to phone it in. You can throw up a pencil condenser around the 12th fret and just do a couple takes, bang them out and call it a day. Bury them in the mix and no one's gonna know. In 2019, I did a songwriting challenge as part of my solo project, Night Winds. I thought it'd be fun to try to write, produce and record an entire song in less than 24 hours. But there was a twist. I also did a photo shoot for the cover art and made a lyric video on the same day. And at the end of the 24 hours, I uploaded my song to DistroKid, scheduled the lyric video to go live on YouTube, and that was that. Start to finish in less than one day. I thought it was a pretty novel concept, and this was before I had ever heard of Andrew Huang or Jared Dines or any of the other YouTubers who have done challenges like this one. The closest thing I had seen was Blanks, an awesome musician who remakes pop songs in exactly one hour. So anyway, I set my alarm for midnight, woke up, and started making this song. And at the end of the challenge, I was decently stoked about the track. It had lyrics that made sense, the beat was pretty interesting, and when the song dropped, I wasn't totally embarrassed about it. But at the end of the challenge, I had a weird feeling. Non-accomplishment. Was the song good? Sure. Is it the best song I've ever written? Probably not, but it did fit in with the rest of my music. It didn't stick out as something worse than any other song I put out, and in fact, a few of my friends said it was their favorite Nightwind song yet. Did I feel bad about this song? Was my sense of non-accomplishment because I didn't do a good job? No. In fact, it was because I had done exactly what I should have been doing the whole time. 24 hours is a lot. If your band practices for an hour a week, 24 hours is how much you should practice in around six months. If you worked on a song for two hours a day, 24 hours is 12 straight days of working on it. And yeah, it's cool to do it all consecutively, but I realized that I've done songwriting sessions that were four to six hours and left with a track, a scratch vocal, a pretty solid production demo out the door. Like we all know it shouldn't take 24 entire hours to make a three minute song, but somehow when it comes to YouTube, things feel different. Because believe it or not, a lot of YouTube music sucks. And as someone who has made a lot of music as well as a lot of YouTube videos, I think I can talk about why. Chapter one, the black garlic. I don't know if you've ever seen the show Bob's Burgers, but there's an episode called Best Burger that really spoke to me. If you haven't seen the show, Bob is a lovable dad who also runs a burger shop. And this shouldn't come as a surprise. It's called Bob's Burgers. In this episode, Bob enters a burger cooking competition and he's got a secret weapon, 
black garlic. It's a fermented garlic from Korea, and it's a silver bullet to pull out the victory. However, Bob forgot the black garlic back at the shop. His chances of winning really start to slip. And when his family offers to make the trek to go get his secret ingredient for him, he tells them not to bother, because he'll just turn in a burger without it. To fast forward a bit, he finally reveals that he doesn't want them to go get the black garlic because he's insecure about the possibility of losing. But if he loses because he forgot one ingredient, he'll have an excuse, a reason to fall back on so that his skills as a chef aren't to blame. He'd rather lose on his own terms than have a chance at winning. Now, I'm not going to spoil any more of this episode for you, but this is something that I feel a lot in the music space. Because when it comes to YouTube music, myself included, it feels like we are all leaving the black garlic at home. Can I make a great song? One that will truly stand the test of time? Well, it's kind of scary to try that and fail. Can I make a pretty decent song using a chord progression I pulled out of a hat, an instrument that I bought for $34 on Amazon, and in less than six hours? Well, sure. Will it be a song that truly touches the hearts of the audience, or something that I'd like to show my grandkids one day? Certainly not. But at least I got a few laughs and some comments that said, you know, for a song that was made in six hours with an electric kazoo, this is actually pretty good. And for a while, that feels like enough. Chapter two, I don't wanna waste a real song on this. In business, there's a concept called the minimum viable product, MVP for short. When you're creating a new piece of technology or a service and you wanna bring it to market, you can fundraise, work really hard, and sink your life savings into bringing this product to market. But when that happens, when you do all that work, put everything on the line, and it turns out your invention isn't that great, well, how screwed will you be? What happens if no one wants or needs or likes your invention? That's where the MVP comes in. The inventor can make a minimum viable product. It's basically a version of your product that has just enough features to be useful. You can share it with focus groups, show it to your friends and family, and see if there's actually a market for this thing before you sink your parents' 401k into the final product. In theory, this is a nice idea, but something pretty annoying has started happening. More and more corporations have started pushing these MVPs to market. Video games that have tons of bugs that will eventually get patched up later, or maybe some DLC, who knows. Cars that may or may not have self-destructing batteries. Piles of scooters dumped on sidewalks across cities and apps that you try to use as a customer, but you end up being the beta tester. Instead of coming to market with a fleshed out product, we are the test audience for a lot of these new products. And the worst part is, we paid to do it. When it comes to making YouTube videos about music, it's kind of hard to admit, but it feels like a lot of us creators will put out the minimum viable song. It's got a riff, it's got vocals, it's got a beat. And yes, it's actually a song, but it's not a song song. Like nobody would put it on at the gym or while they're driving around town. And it makes sense because if I'm reviewing a microphone or a new synth plugin, I don't wanna waste a song song on it. And let's face it, if we're truly honest with ourselves, songs are a renewable resource. If I can make one good one, well, I can make another one tomorrow. As a professional producer and songwriter, if I just ran out of songs, then my career would be over. But I don't want to use up one of the good songs that I've been working on to show off a compression plugin I got sent. I can't use an artist song that I've been working on producing because I don't want to deal with trying to keep the video monetized. So what do we do? Splice loop, easy chord progression, Vocals that are cliche if you're lucky enough to get vocals. And if we're all racing to get our review of this brand new product up before the other guy, well, we're gonna cut some corners. And frankly, I don't think the audience always cares. If you're listening to a YouTube video to see how you feel about a compressor plugin, you may not care if the music in the demo is top tier Grammy winning material. But on the flip side, it does encourage a bad habit in the ones creating, and that is settling for the minimum viable song every single time. If you spend any time on this platform, I'm sure you've heard or seen at least one person complain about the almighty algorithm. The algorithm giveth, 
and the algorithm taketh away. And while I don't have any hard proof, it seems like if you skip a few uploads, it skews heavily towards taketh away. So that means we're all pretty much stuck to trying to post on some sort of schedule. And looking at your upload schedule and seeing that you're making 52 videos this year and the year after that and the year after that and so on, well, it starts to feel pretty heavy. And if you really want to spend multiple weeks working on a video to really crush it, put together some awesome music for it, and also come up with an angle that makes it clickable, you can't just stop posting. So that means you're going to be working on multiple videos a week until it's done. I don't want to pull back the curtain too much, and I know that not everyone wants to see how the sausage is made, but to make a 10 to 15 minute video on here, it takes more effort than you might think. Combine that with the fact that you can get away with making the minimum viable song most of the time, as long as your thumbnail and your title are on point, and that's how you end up with a lot of low effort material. Chapter three, musical minimalism. Musical minimalism advice is flowing out of this platform. Less is more. You can record an entire album with an SM58. You can go with your first draft. You can do it all with stock plugins. Do I disagree with this advice? It's complicated. On one hand, this stuff is great for getting you out of a rut. If you have a really bad habit of spending forever and a day trying to figure out what mic to use for your lead vocals, pairing your collection down to one or two great mics is probably a good idea. If you don't know how EQ works in the first place, what good is it to have 10 different EQ plugins that offer subtly different EQ? If you haven't completed a song in months, sticking to your first draft and putting it out there is great advice. But on the other hand, what do you do when you're out of that rut? When you've got your default sounds figured out. For me, I can personally tell you that I got stuck in the minimalist production thing for a while, and it became its own rut that I got stuck in. There's no problem with having a go-to guitar tone, a default synth patch that you pull up all the time, whatever it is. But after a while, you've got to do something that challenges yourself again. When we optimize everything, when we systemize and strategize to the point where music creation is on autopilot, that's when we can start to lose connection to our art, the very thing that we set out to create. Sometimes more is more. Sometimes it's good to push through a wall that you built yourself. Sometimes the only way to get where you actually want to go is to paddle through a hundred options until you find the one that really makes your art yours. So what am I going to do about it? Well, all of this insecurity, all of the hamster wheel mentality of creating every week, all of the musical minimalism, it sets creators up to make music that frankly, well, sucks. So moving forward, I want to explore what I'd create if I had zero boundaries, zero worries about failing. What would I make with unlimited time, unlimited resources, and with as many revisions and drafts as I need to really make something that I feel is special? What would I create if I wasn't concerned with the potential to swing and miss? It's been a long time since I really did something like that. So moving forward, will I make short, simple songs to show off a piece of gear or a technique? Yeah, I'm sure that I will. But I also want to make some music for this channel that I would be proud to show my heroes, that I'd be excited to play at a show, that I'd be glad to burn on the CD that is my musical legacy without any footnotes. No excuses, just this is me. This is what I made. This is what I'm proud of. And I hope you will too.